This is Ken McDermott Rowe. Welcome to History Counts. Forty years ago, an American naval vessel, the USS Liberty, was the victim of an unprovoked and savage attack by a foreign country while it was stationed in the Mediterranean Sea. Today's guest, retired naval officer James Ennis, was an eyewitness to the attack. We'll talk about the bloody details of the attack, and we'll talk about the events that followed, described by a top U.S. admiral as, quote, an official cover-up without precedent in American naval history. We'll be back with our guest, James Ennis, after this short break. Our guest today is James Ennis, author of Assault on the Liberty, which recounts the devastating attack on the United States Navy ship the Liberty during the Six-Day War. Mr. Ennis, a retired U.S. naval officer, was serving as a lieutenant on the USS Liberty at the time of the attack. He's also one of the creators of the USS Liberty Memorial website, located at ussliberty.org. Mr. Ennis, thanks very much for being with us today. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. Uh, Mr. Ennis, for those who aren't familiar with this attack, uh, if you could put it in some context for us by telling us first when it occurred and where was the Liberty at the time of the attack. This was on June 8th, 1967, just a bit over 40 years ago, in the eastern Mediterranean, uh, along the Gaza Strip, which uh, was the border between Israel and Egypt. We were sent out there. Uh, we were in t an intelligence ship, and we were sent out there to collect radio signals, uh, actually primarily of the Soviets that were in the area. And I was off to the deck on the ship that morning, 7 o'clock until noon, and uh, so I brought the ship to the coast, and at about 12 miles from the coast, right parallel the course, slowed the ship to five knots. We just proceeded down the coast. What, what was going on at the war at that time? The war had begun a few days before the attack on, on 5 June, correct? That's right. So this was the fourth day of the war. Quiet. We knew that over the mountains there was uh, some shooting going on, but uh, where we were was quite peaceful. The visibility was unlimited. Uh, high in the sky, airplanes were flying over apparently toward the war. And Israel had been successful at that point in the war? Oh, very much. In the first 30 minutes or so of the war, which was initiated by the Israelis, the Israelis uh, with a surprise attack, uh, destroyed just about every Arab airplane uh, in the Middle East, so that there was almost no opposition by the time we arrived four days later. They had attacked Egypt, Syria, Jordan, all suddenly and by surprise? Yes. Nasser had been making some noises on the coast, but he had no intention of, of invading, but very, very bellicose. And Israelis have admitted since then, that they knew he was not going to attack, and they used that as an excuse to uh, capture more Arab land. So uh, that was what was going on, and they didn't want the United States to know of their plans. They had a particular plan that actually was an attack that was going to go on the morning of, of 8 June, isn't that correct? They planned to invade the Golan Heights and capture the Golan from Syria on the 8th of June. And this was not anticipated by the international community? This would have been a, a surprise? It was feared. I, I talked to Secretary of State Dean Rusk afterward, and he, when I, my book was published, and he told me that uh, they were afraid that Israel was going to do that, and they were trying to persuade them to hold back. Uh, Rusk said he stayed on the phone with the Israelis all night, uh, urging them to keep their forces where they were and not to escalate the war because they were afraid the Russians would get into it. So the U.S. was neutral in this war? Officially, we were, we were neutral. We appeared to be siding more with the Israelis than anything else, but we weren't taking a, an active role in this shooting. And the Liberty was in, interna in international waters at the time? It was. We were just past the 12-mile limit, which the Egyptians claimed as their territorial waters. Israel, I think, claimed three or Perhaps it was the other way, but we made a point to stay uh, just beyond the 12-mile limit uh, where we wouldn't be seen by either side as within their territorial waters. Well, now, as you said, you were coming on deck for the 0800 watch, and this is in military time. It'd be for civilians 8 o'clock in the morning. You came on a little early, as I, I note from your book. What was the situation uh, on the ship at that time? I Actually, I 
it was the custom to relieve the watch closer to 7 or 7.15 just so that the off-going watch could have breakfast. I was officer of the deck from 7.15 or so until 12. This situation was quite calm. We had, uh, it was since it was a bright, sunny day, uh, and there was no sign of hostilities near us, uh, we had men who were off duty sunbathing on deck. It was pretty relaxed. And uh, around 11 o'clock, uh, suddenly there was a puff of smoke on the on the coast. Uh, we didn't know what that was, but uh, thick black smoke uh, coursed down the coast in the wind. So we learned much later that that was an ammunition dump that had blown up but it really had nothing to do with us. The officer you were relieving mentioned that you had some uh, aircraft visiting you be, uh, before you came up. We did. Before I came on watch, uh, around 6 o'clock, there was an Israeli, a slow Israeli reconnaissance plane that circled us. As soon as I took the watch, uh, another airplane circled us. And then every 45 minutes all morning, uh, about every 45 minutes, an Israeli a uh, recon plane or a pair of jet aircraft would come out and circle us two or three times. Did you believe that those aircraft could identify the ship and its country? We knew they did because, uh, remember, we were an intercept ship, and we had 100 men down below who were uh, with earphones listening to radios, and they heard these uh, jet pilots uh, and the recon pilots as they circled us, each time they would radio their headquarters and say, we are circling in a, a ship with an American flag and men sunbathing on deck. So it was very clear that, that they knew who we were that uh, and their headquarters knew who we were. In fact, the flag was significant. You caused it to be changed. We had replaced. been steaming across the Mediterranean at high speed at 17, 18 knots for nearly a week, and the flag uh, had gotten dirty from smoke and tattered from the wind. So the first thing I did when I took the watch at 7 o'clock was to order that flag replaced. The uh, signalman quartermaster protested because he said, that's my last flag. I don't have any more clean flags. And I told him, I don't care. We are going to show our brightest, cleanest colors in here so that these planes circling us know exactly who we were. I was relieved at 12, uh, but I came back at 1 o'clock for general quarters. So uh, I came on this time as junior officer of the deck. Well, another officer was at OD, but I still had the con. I I was driving. So you were, a, you were a naval lieutenant, which would be, for those who don't know, Navy rank would be comparable to an Army captain. So you'd be, you were just one grade below the executive officer, uh, Lieutenant Commander uh, Phil Armstrong? That's right. So you are on the bridge? I was on, I was on the bridge uh, again from 1 o'clock until 2 o'clock. So I, at that point, I was junior officer of the deck, and I was still driving. During the morning, I was usually the only officer on the bridge. But for general quarters, the captain and several other officers were there for that occasion. We finally uh, we finished our general quarters drill at just before 2, and suddenly, as I was being relieved, radar picked up three very fast boats approaching the ship, just coming over the horizon 15 miles away. And uh, immediately over the top of the boats, we picked up three jet aircraft approaching the ship. Uh, I was just being relieved, uh, and I went with the ship's photographer up to the next deck, the fourth deck of the ship, to try to take some pictures of these approaching jets. Uh, we had been, as I said, circled all day, and these were more, appeared to be more of the same. So uh, I went up on the 04 level and along the starboard side of the ship, that's the right side, I could see uh, these jets passing down the side. They turned left and made a big 180-degree left circle and came straight down the center line, straight at us. The um, photographer with, his, with a Nikon and a long lens on it was watching them through the lens, taking pictures, and suddenly they started firing. We had men in all four gun mounts. Uh, there were just 50 caliber machine gun mounts. But from where I stood on the 04 level, I could see the direct hits to all the gun mounts as men were just blown literally high into the air from the explosions. And, uh, and then the first airplane passed overhead, and I looked out, and there was a second one turning to make its run. I had been hit by shrapnel from the first explosions, which broke my leg about five inches above the knee. 
my leg looked like it had two knees. Yet, remarkably, I was standing on one leg and, and thrown up against the railing, so I wasn't knocked off my feet. Everybody around me had fallen and was bleeding. I was able to, on one good leg, I was able to hop down the ladder into the pilot house on the next deck, where about that time the second airplane hit and uh, blew more holes in the pilot house, and there was blood and men on deck everywhere, and captain calling to send a message to the Sixth Fleet that were under attack. So Captain uh, McGonagall, who later received the Congressional Medal of Honor, I understand, he immediately sent a, 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 a request for help? That's right. Now, that was difficult as the attacking airplanes were jamming our radios, so it took a few minutes to get a message out because uh, all we heard was buzzsaw noises on, on the radio frequencies that we wanted to use. But we did, uh, within about 10 minutes, we got a message out. We got a reply from the carrier Saratoga uh, that was about 300 miles away, and they said, we will, we'll, uh, we're sending port immediately. Remarkable thing there was that uh, we later talked to Captain Tully. He said as soon as his airplanes got to the horizon, uh, he got a message from Washington saying to get those airplanes back. Why did they call them back? We have been asking for 40 years why they called them back. They, uh, the official story is that they called them back because the attack was over. Well, that wasn't true at all. Uh, there were two separate launches of aircraft. The first one that was launched almost immediately, those were called back. It was more than an hour later that they sent another set of aircraft to our aid, and those also were immediately called back. Now, the Navy's story is that there was only one launch of aircraft that as soon as they were launched, they got an apology from Israel saying that it was all over and that it was, they didn't need, we didn't need help anymore, so they were called the jets. Now, I understand that, yes, Ms. That McKenna's. conveniently ignores the entire hour and a quarter or so that we were under attack. Well, you, the, you were first attacked, I understand, by Mirage fighter bombers, but they were then joined by Mystere jets that uh, went to Napalm. That's right. The Mirages uh, actually exhausted all their uh, ammo and armament, and uh, they left the area and were immediately replaced by uh, Mysteers carrying more cannon and napalm, and so they continued the... Uh, Isn't it unusual to hit a ship with napalm? I think it is. They may have carried napalm because they use it a lot against the uh, tanks in the desert, but it's probably unusual. It's also pretty lethal, is it, since they had already punched close to 821 six- and eight-inch holes in the ship with their uh, rockets, the... Uh, Napalm would then slosh into the rocket holes and cause fires inside. It was uh, pretty exciting. Yeah, you, you say in your book, quote, the entire superstructure of the ship burst into a wall of flames, end quote. That's quite so. And you had a quite, a, quite a, a few casualties at this point, but this wasn't the end of the attack. You then, uh, uh, 1424, which would be uh, 224 in civilian time, you had a surface attack from uh, boats, right? Well, that was... Uh, 235, actually, that the torpedo hit, and that was followed immediately. They fired three torpedo boats, that the ones that we had first seen when we first saw the aircraft. Uh, those arrived at 235, fired five torpedoes, fortunately missed with four of them. One of them blew a 40-foot hole in the side of the ship, killed 25 more men in addition to the, the uh, nine who were already dead and dying from the aircraft attack. That flooded the large center compartment of the ship that held the, our intercept team and um, very nearly took us down. The ship took on a considerable list from all the water we had. You're right. They continued to circle the ship after launching the torpedoes. Yeah, and that's where, you, again, you get into the uh, deliberateness of the attack. The Israeli story, which they told the United States, was that uh, at that point, as soon as they launched the torpedo, they saw our American flag, recognized as an American, and never fired again. And that is total falsehood. They fired the torpedo. Three boats came within 50 feet of the ship by the stern, where our name was marked in large English letters, hovered around there for a few minutes, and then they circled us uh, on and off for the next 40 minutes, firing at anything that moved. They fired on stretcher bearers on the main deck and bridge personnel. 
by this time we had an oversized American flag. The one that I had hauled up had been shot down and was immediately replaced with the holiday colors, which were about 8 by 12 feet. So those, that flag was clearly shown, uh, and our name in English. I mean, consider the difference between an Arab warship and an American uh, Navy ship. We have uh, our name in English on the stern and 10-foot high letters GTR-5 on the bow. They claimed they thought we were the Egyptian horse carrier El Khazar, which was waiting to be scrapped uh, port at Alexandria. They, they, they claim that they mistook the Liberty for an Egyptian ship that was uh, being scrapped? Yes. The, the um, El Khazar was a horse carrier for the Egyptian cavalry who was 265 feet long uh, compared to our 450 feet or 540 feet. It looks nothing whatsoever like us, and they certainly knew that it was uh, in port being scrapped. But once they, when we didn't sink as we were supposed to, they needed an excuse, so they said that they thought we were the El Quasar. You also lowered life rafts in, the, in anticipation of a need to abandon ship. What happened then? We launched life rafts at 3.15. They immediately came closer, machine gunned the life rafts in the water took one of them aboard and left for a few minutes uh, with that because uh, we were being promised that six fleet aircraft were on the way, and they were obviously afraid that they would be uh, counter the jets from the Sixth fleet, so they left. At that point, they started sending, we're so sorry, we thought it was an Egyptian ship, we apologize for the mistake messages. How many casualties did the, the Liberty suffer? 34 dead and... 174 wounded. That number varies because uh, there have been men within the last couple of years who have gotten Purple Hearts for wounds that weren't uh, recognized for Purple Hearts at the time. But there's 174 wounded and 34 dead. So as I understand it, that's about two-thirds of the, of the whole crew was either dead or wounded? Yeah, we had 297 men total. Did you know they were, were Israelis by the end of the attack? Most of us didn't. The airplanes that attacked us were not marked, and that's another indication that it was a lowered attack. And nobody saw markings on the attacking aircraft. The attacking motor torpedo boats apparently had a small Star of David flying, but that was not seen by very many people, if any. The little was known about who was attacking us until we heard it on the radio from the uh, picked up a broadcast from the BBC. But the Pentagon and the Johnson administration accepted the Israeli apology and their explanation that it was not on purpose? Uh, they accepted the apology. They declined to accept the explanation. Uh, Dean Rusk himself, as Secretary of State, has said uh, many times that they accepted the apology for diplomatic reasons. They never believed their story about uh, it being an accident or why it Nonetheless, nonetheless, there was a court of inquiry uh, that was held immediately after. afterward. Did it uh, result in a finding that uh, Israel was culpable? Uh, or did it address the that? The court of inquiry was told what to find. They concluded that the attack was deliberate and that uh, Israel knew they were attacking an American ship. That was not the finding that they published because they were ordered by the White House to publish a false report. Uh, there is now online in my website and elsewhere a sworn statement by the legal counsel to the court who says they lied, uh, they published a false report, and even that report uh, was changed in Washington. The, the members of the court signed it and sent it to Washington where pages were removed and uh, other pages were rewritten. There was a, an independent commission that studied the liberty uh, headed by uh, the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Thomas Moore, a, in 2003. And he said, quote, there, is never, there, has, there has been an official cover-up without precedent in American naval history, end quote. That's right. He uh, published that report, which uh, contradicts the official report and, and concludes that it was a deliberate attack. Have any members, uh, any surviving members of the crew, ever been, had the opportunity to testify about the uh, attack before a congressional committee? No. We have been asking for 40 years for an opportunity to testify. 
in fact, that's one of the ironies of this thing. There's a there's a um, bankruptcy magistrate in Florida who spends his time trying to disprove the story of the Liberty. Uh, he's written a book uh, in which he claims that there have been 11 or 12 official government investigations, five congressional investigations, and that they have all proven and concluded that the attack was a tragic accident. And that is a tragic lie. Uh, there has never been a government investigation that concluded that the attack was, was an accident, as the Israelis claim. Would you, at that slight date, 40 years after the attack, uh, would you like to see a congressional investigation? We still ask for that. Nobody will, nobody will give us that. We thought when, when the attack first occurred that the lies that were obviously being told by the Israeli government would be corrected when we had a chance to testify. But we were never allowed to testify. We were not allowed to tell our stories even to the Navy Court of Inquiry. Uh, and after that, no member of Congress held, ever held hearings. Uh, our story was never legally, officially told anywhere in government. Uh, can I ask you one last question? And that I take that from uh, an excerpt from the commission headed by Admiral Thomas Moore, uh, 2003. He said, quote, A danger to our national security exists whenever our elected officials are willing to subordinate American interest to those of any foreign nation, end quote. Could you give me your thoughts on that? Oh, that's absolutely the case. Uh, in, in a situation like this, here we have a, a small foreign power that deliberately uh, attacked an American ship, killed 34 men, and Congress won't even talk to those 34 men. They take at face value the excuse by the attackers and don't even listen to or allow the the victims to tell the truth about what happened. The only way we have ever had a chance to tell the story is in places like this radio show and, and an occasional book or letter to the editor. The people who attack us are much better financed and more numerous, and every time we tell a story, the bad guys are out there calling us liars. We can prove everything we say, and Congress won't listen to us. Uh, we don't have an opportunity to tell our story very much. Well, thanks very much for being with us today, Mr. Ness, to tell the story. This is Ken McDermott Rowe, and I've been talking to Mr. James Ennis about the Israeli attack on the USS Liberty during the Six-Day War. I'll be back in a moment with some final thoughts. Why would Israel have launched such a brutal and unprovoked attack on the USS Liberty? The United States had always been friendly to Israel and was a neutral in 1967 Six-Day War. Furthermore, the Liberty was steaming in international waters. The actual reasons for Israel's attack on the Liberty remain secret. However, as Israel planned its June 8 attack on Syria's Golan Heights, the international community including the United States, was urgently brokering a ceasefire. Mr. Ennis writes, quote, With the war virtually over and the world crying for peace, could Israel put troops in Syria without being seen as an aggressor? Not with USS Liberty so close to shore and presumably listening, end quote. Mr. Ennis observes that it was a remarkable coincidence that Israel postponed its planned attack in Syria one day while in a coordinated air and sea attack it removed the USS Liberty from the picture. Please visit us at historycounts.org, where you can listen for free to an archive of this program and others. Until next time, this is Ken McDermott Rowe for History Counts.